Well, good morning. It's good being with you. Did I see that Trudy has arrived? So would one of you like to come up and show Trudy to everyone since she's an Alaskan baby? So... And then maybe they can even zoom in on her so everybody can see her online. So. Well, how did she travel? She did good. How did you do? I'm tired. <laughs> oh, my. Isn't she beautiful? Uh, well, we're so glad to have her. And, and Allison's going to be here for a few weeks, aren't you? William's out in the wilderness, literally, and yes. so he's out roughing it. So thank you guys for coming, and, and we always enjoy having you. And, uh, and Katie had a, a baby reveal, and it's a little boy. Okay, congratulations. So. And there's, there's another little baby over here, Charlie. And he's, uh, so, just, uh, so. It's good having all of those children, isn't it? Thank you. Well, welcome back to Calvary Chapel, and we're continuing our series, Changing Your Life, Becoming the Person That God Wants You to Be. Last week, we looked at John chapter 3, and we looked at the conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus had, and Jesus told him he had to be born again. Uh, we've talked about that. It's called regeneration. That's just a big word that just means you need to be, give your life over to the Lord. And when we become a Christian, the inward change of regeneration is manifested by outward changes. Paul said, therefore, if any be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Well, regeneration is part of this process and the beginning of this process of spiritual transformation. In other words, those are just big words that we become more Christ-like. When you and I give our lives to Jesus, we're immediately thrown into spiritual battle. And I know this is difficult and hard for some people. Often people will come up to one of the pastors and say, you know, I'm really struggling because I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm still struggling to change. I'm still struggling with some of these old sinful habits and these things that seem to, to, to hurt me and bother me. We go to seminars, we go to conferences, we look for painless clues, our cures to our hurts and our bad habits and our hangups. We want to have self-discipline, but we're like the man who said, I can stand everything except for temptation. You know, the reality is, for myself, it's hard. I can't even stay on a diet, let alone other, overcome bad habits on my own. I w had to go back to the neurosurgeon. I'm going to have another back surgery in a few weeks. But uh, he told me, I want you to lose 10 pounds. And, and I looked at him, and I said, you know, 10 pounds, that's okay. And I, I told him, I said, well, I like the 3C diet. I like candy, cookies, and cake. And he said, you can't have those. So anyway, but uh, we're all on a diet, and Anna doesn't like it very much because we're all trying to lose weight, and they're helping me because I have to do this by the 1st of July. And so Anna, the other day, she was mumbling to herself. She's watching online probably. And she said, why do we have to suffer for Dad? <laughs> anyway, so everybody's suffering in our house. But so often Christians are more loyal to wrong lifestyles and behaviors than they are to the Lord and letting the Lord transform their lives. If you have your Bible, let's look to Ephesians. We're going to look at chapter uh, 4. Ephesians chapter 4, again, beginning with verse 17. And it reads... Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became calloused and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught of him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your formal way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Therefore, putting away lying, speaking the, speak the truth, each one of to your neighbor, because we are members of one another, be angry and do not sin. Now, I want to point out to you that 
that Paul is not writing this letter to a group of, of heathens, a group of people who aren't Christians. He's writing these to Christians. And this is a reminder for all of us, once we become a Christian, it's really easy to slip back into that old sinful nature. So let's go on and read what he says. Don't let the sun go down in your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands, so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouths. How many of you know that the Bible does say you need to watch your mouth? Watch what you say. But only what is good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you in Christ. Well, in the New Testament times and the present, destructive behavior has been a common thing. It's been a common thing that the church and individuals as Christians have had to fight. Paul lists six different lists of bad stuff that you should not go back into in his epistle. Six times in the different readings, he lists all of these things. Do you realize the only one who can keep the believer free from the sinful nature is the Holy Spirit of God? That's what we're going to talk about today. How can we get rid of destructive behavior in our life? How can we get rid of all of these temptations that are coming? You'll never get rid of the temptations, but it's the dwelling on them we'll look at. The Bible constantly warns us as believers about the dark side or the sinful nature. Yet the pull of the world and all the hang-ups and bad habits constantly are plaguing the Christian life as they aren't living a consistent life of victory in Christ. So we're going to read now in Galatians, if you want to go there, chapter 5, verse 16. And it says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. So what is Paul saying? If you don't want to, to, to carry out the desires of the flesh, you have to walk in the Spirit. And he goes and say, For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are under the law. Uh, excuse me, you are under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, frac factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's the bad list. That's the things that he said you don't want to go back to. You don't want to start doing those things. And then he gives us this wonderful list. He says... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of you would agree that if all Christians exhibited the fruit of the Spirit, everything would go so much better for all of us and in our communities? It goes on to say, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, Paul, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, he presents this contrast between the, the sarx, that's the, the Greek name, the flesh, and the pneuma, which is the spirit. And these verses appear to be both a warning and an encouragement. It's a warning to us because he lists all these things that it's easy for us to slip back into. But it's an encouragement to us to know that we can be victorious through the Holy Spirit, letting the Spirit lead us and guide us, and we can have these fruit of the Spirit. Now, if we compare and contrast the sinful nature of the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to discover some spiritual gems. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I'd like to point them out to you. Gem number one is this, the spirit and the flesh are incompatible. You can't mix them. They don't go together. That's why as a Christian, you can't walk in the worldliness of the world and follow Christ. It just doesn't work because it's an incompatible lifestyle because the things that the world offers and the flesh offers is not what God offers. God offers freedom and those things put you in bondage. Gym number two is that they're polar opposites. The sinful nature is always secret and it's invisible. Its works though are public and evident. Sinful works destroy and it hinders relationships with God and other people. 
But the Holy Spirit is inward. It's inside us and visible in the believer's life. Its works, the fruit, are public and evident, and it's a positive way. And it helps them to be more Christ-like. And gem number three is if Paul uses the plural, or Paul uses the plural to describe the 15 acts of the sinful nature, but he uses the singular to describe the nine fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that that 15 things that he said you shouldn't do, you can t- they're not all together. You can do three or four of them, but you know they're, 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 not, they're singular in that they do things, but the fruit of the Spirit's not like that. When you have the fruit of the Spirit of your life, all nine of those fruits are part of your life. They're not singular. They're, they're, they are singular. They're a part of you. And the, the, the sinful natures, you can do these things, but if you really love the Lord and you go through that nine uh, fruit of the Spirit, these are things that God wants all of his people to have. It's not optional. If there's one of them you don't like, if you say, I don't want to be patient, I'm not a patient person, God's not going to let you rest with that. Do you know what the Holy Spirit's going to do? He's going to send people in your life to teach you patience. Patience is one thing you need to be careful about praying for. Sim number four is works puts the emphasis on human endeavor. These works of the flesh are things that you do. But the fruit is divine empowerment. It's when the Holy Spirit of God empowers you to live this way. And Jim number five, the 15 vices are classified into, into four groups. We don't hear a lot about this because it's so anti-cultural today, but it needs to be preached about. It needs to be talked about because there's things as Christians we need to avoid. And just because everyone else seems to be doing it doesn't mean that we need to be doing it. We need to be a peculiar people. We need to be the kind of people who stand up for the Lord. Well, let's look at him. First off, he talks about some sexual sins. I think all of us would agree we live in a sex-saturated society today. He lists some things, sexual sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, or just living a horrible life. He talks about religious deviations, and that's just a big word of things that aren't right. He talked about idolatry and witchcraft. And witchcraft, if you look back to the root of it, uh, it goes back to pharmacy. In other words, it goes back to drugs. Did you know that? Drugs are a part of all of that stuff. And then a disorder of personal relationships, hatred and discord and jealousy and fits of rage and envy. I would not want to be a police officer today because what they have to do every day, but what they have to see every day would be horrible. Because people today are so angry. They're so full of of hatred and, and jealousy and fits of rage and envy. Then there's sins of intemperance, drunkenness and orgies. But then we come to the fruit of the Spirit. And for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. But before we do, I wanted to make sure that we first of all understood in order for our walk with the Lord to be what it should be, we have to be born again. That's why that first sermon was on this. This sermon is on how can we be victorious over all of the sinful things all around us. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is divided into three triads. God word, the things that we do for God. We love, we have joy, we have peace. Then their man word, what we help for other people, long-suffering and kindness and goodness. And then their self word, things that we need to change and be faithful and meek and self-controlled. The secret of Christian living, Paul reveals, is to live by the Spirit of God. And the results of living in the Spirit is this inward change that empowers the believer to be under the constant moment-by-moment direction, control, and guidance of the Spirit. Why do we have this continual battle? Why do we always have these things coming into our life? I've been a Christian for almost 52 years, yet I'm still so weak in so many areas. I win one battle, and then almost immediately I'm involved in more spiritual battle. And God gives me victory, and I succumb to Satan's attack, and I experience the guilt and the uselessness and the shame of spiritual defeat in my life. Am I the only one who's ever felt that way? I think we all have. How can I live a life of victory? How can I grow as a Christian? Let's deal first of all with why do we have this continual battle in our sinful nature? And just a side note, I want to just remind all of us, you can't fly with the eagles if you hang out with the turkeys. You might need to think about that. But during this process of spiritual maturity, the believer is the chief target of Satan's fury. You have a target on your back when you become a Christian, and Satan is going to do all that he can to destroy you. He seeks to destroy, detest, deceive, and terrorize the believer. David Jeremiah said there are several reasons why the tug of the flesh seems so strong in the believer's life. One reason, he said, is that the pull of the old habits and the thought patterns are strong, and the believer has the tendency to slip back into his old ways. You know, we have, we'll be soon launching our Celebrate uh, Recovery Groups. 
It's a wonderful program. But one of the things I want you to know is, uh, Russ, how many, what percent actually are drugs come into, how much? One out of every three. One third. One third come because of drug addictions. The two thirds come because of hangups or problems they're having. Could be something like lying. It could be something with bad attitudes. It could be a lot more involved in that. So the one thing that they'll do, though, is they're going to get you uh, working in a group because they know that you need to be in a group. You need a support group. And then you go through these studies, biblical studies, and, and there's 24 lessons, the very first group of, of lessons you do. And the reason they do that is because they know that it's by God's power that we can change. You know, I told you that, that I've got to lose some weight and I like food. And I'll be honest, Randall Burrell and I, we, we kind of have the same problem. Juanita hides all of Randall's cakes and stuff and Betsy hides all the candy, but we're really good at finding it. You know why I, I you know, like now I've, I, I've not been eating candy and cookies and cake and, and I, I miss it, I crave it. But I tell you what, I didn't even go by some of the Sunday school classes because I knew I couldn't pass up those donuts that they have. So see, there's always this pull. No matter how much, how old you are, no matter how much you think you've overcome, Satan is always leaning and throwing some little things at you. He knows exactly where the chink is in your armor. He goes on to say that the influence of culture, the world, and the irresponsibility of the believer's life pull the believer to the sinful uh, nature of problems. See, everyone in this room, everyone in this world has a problem, and that problem is sin. And we are responsible and accountable for our sins. We cannot do anything about it that's fully significant or in a sufficient way. Trying to do better does not work, so we need help because the sin is hurting us and it's hurting those around us. And help has come in the form of the gospel, God's word. Now, often, and I, I did this for years, I thought the harder I try, the more I can have victory. And do you realize it's not trying harder, it's trying higher. It's turning it over to the Lord and saying, Lord, I can't get victory over this, but I know you can. I know that greater is you who is in me than he that is in this world. And I can't do this, but I know you can. Lord, take care of this problem. Temptation is a common problem for all Christians. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humility, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will the temptation, he will make also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So in other words, God says, yes, there's going to be temptations. There's going to be things that is going to really tempt you to do that you know you shouldn't do, and God's always going to make a door. Has anyone ever been in a big building where they have escape doors and they put on their, you know, emergency exit only, don't open. Don't open it because if you do, alarms go off. I don't know who did that, but somebody did. Um, and so what, what do we do? Often God provides these opportunities and these doors for us to escape. And what do we do? We don't do it. How many of you have a, a weather alert radio? You have one, Elaine? Did it go off a lot last night? I haven't figured out how to turn ours down, but I tell you what, it'll, it'll shake you up and get you out of bed quick because it goes off and it just makes these horrible sounds. And it's, there's a reason for it because they're wanting to warn you that there's a storm, a tornado or whatever coming in. They'll talk and tell you what it is. But, you know, I'll be honest, last night, I don't know how many times mine went off, but the last time it went off, I came really close to just throwing it out in the rain. <laughs> but the whole purpose of that is to warn me and the Holy Spirit of God is inside you. And the Holy Spirit of God gives you wisdom. The Holy Spirit of God leads you and convicts you and shows you the doors that you should go through, not the ones that maybe we want to go through. A great temptation for the believers to forget that's what sin actually is. It always appears in some fashion as independence from God and usurping God's role. We want to be the Lord of our life instead of letting Jesus be the Lord of life. There is no temptation that doesn't have a price tag. And the battle with temptation is won or lost, the Bible says, in our minds. When we give in to temptation, it anesthetizes our conscience and convictions. And the more we habitually sin in an area, the less guilty or remorse we'll feel. Well, how do we overcome this temptation? You need to watch your words. Words can, be, uh, can create or destroy, can build up, or can tear down. You need to also watch your attitude. Don't blame or shame people. Bad attitude is like a flat tire. It's not going to work right until you fix it. Amen? 
And if you've got a bad attitude today and you think, well, that my, you know, my mom had a bad attitude or my uncle had a bad attitude or, you know, I'm Irish or I'm whatever, you know what? A bad attitude is a bad attitude and you shouldn't have a bad attitude. Can I hear an amen? amen. And now, Russell, if they have bad attitude problem, can they sign up for, yes. see, I got you help right here. And, you know, when I used to go on vacation, I always put Shelly in charge of counseling, and she used slap therapy, and we never had anyone that came in for counseling when I was gone. <laughs> you have to watch your temptation. Temptation is constant. They actually have people that go to school and get degrees on how to milk poisonous snakes. Now, that's one job. I don't like snakes. But they do. They end up really poisonous snakes. The venom can be made into different kinds of antidotes for different things. And so they have these people. They actually milk the snake. They get it out of the container, and they hold it up, and they, it, the, the venom comes out the veins, and, and uh, then they put it back in. They were interviewing one of these guys who milks the snake, and they said, you know, isn't this really dangerous? He says, no, not like you think. He said, we're trained on how to do it. And then he said, you know, more people get bit, not when they're getting it out or not when they're milking it. It's when they put it back down, they let their guard down, and it bites them. You know, as soon as you and I put our guard down, we're going to get bit. You have to watch your character. God's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. You have to watch your household. Make sure your family's a priority. We need to clean our house sometimes. We need to get rid of all the idols. You might say, well, I don't have idols in my house. Well, anything you put above God is an idol. You need to correct our thought life. We must own up to our problems. We have to stop blaming. We have to take responsibility. We need to cry out to God for deliverance. And then we have to grow in the spirit and develop spiritual sensitivity. Sin may thrill at first, but eventually it's going to kill you. There's a guy by the name of Bob Record. He wrote a book called uh, Forged by Fire, and he's got quite a testimony. And I was able, actually able to, to visit with him one time. He's a great guy. I, one of his quotes that I often tell people is the quote that he has, every person is one second from stupid. If you think about that, how many of you know that's true? Well, he says that you have to, before you participate in something, you need to check your attitude and check out the activity. He said you need to ask four questions. First of all, how will this affect me personally? He said, second of all, when you're tempted or we want to do something, you ask, how will it affect those that I love? Thirdly, how will it affect others who watch my life? And lastly, how will it affect the cause of Christ in the Christian community? The most effective way to overcome temptation is to be a fruitful productive Christian. Well, God desires for all of us to be overcomers of our sins. And God forgives those who seek his forgiveness. And he can rework the most spoiled life. Jesus can literally remold us. Jeremiah was really discouraged because he thought Israel was never going to change. They were always going to be in captivity. So Jeremiah, God led him to a potter's house. And there he saw the potter, and he was making a vessel, and it was marred. And then he remade the vessel. And then God told him, can I not remake Israel? How many of you believe that God can remake us? You know, we have people today all over. Some of you, I'm sure, are even here. Your life is just shattered. It's in pieces. But God can put those pieces back together through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for that. Well, remember, faith comes from hearing, but growth comes by spiritual disciplines or habits. I'd like to give you a list of things that I believe will empower us and help us to have victory over our sinful nature, our flesh. First of all, you know, it's prayer and Bible study. If you really want to have victory over destructive behavior in our life and over bad behavior, we've got to tap into the Lord's power. When we tap into the Holy Spirit's power, we're enabled to fulfill the law of love. We're able to overcome the sinful nature, and the Holy Spirit will enable us to produce spiritual fruit. We need to think on things above. One of the things Satan always wants to do is to get us focused on ourselves, or what, what our things are and our needs, but you need to put things above. In, the, in Colossians chapter 3, he says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And then he goes on to say that if we're in Christ, you know, we need to, to make sure that we're in Christ and we need to avoid some things. You need to think about good things. Do you realize people today think about all kinds of stuff? But the Bible tells us over and over again to think about good things. If you find yourself always thinking about negative things and you can't get out of that habit, you need to go to celebrate recovery. Now, I'm, I'm not over pushing this, but do you know what I'm saying? If you know you got a problem and you don't do anything about it, 
doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, is not going to happen. Can I hear an amen? amen. So you've got to change. And you've got to let the Holy Spirit guide you. And you've got to start thinking about good things. Paul said, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence or anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. You have to flee youthful lust. And you have to have a spiritual mindset. Affairs always begin with lust. Sin begins as a thought that we dwell on. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about that and how important that is. And then lastly, you need to get a support group that's going to pray for you, encourage you, and confront you, and you them. I truly believe in all the years and 50 years I've been in pastoral ministries, I always believe and I always will believe that Jesus can save people. I always will believe that Jesus can change people. And I do believe that Jesus can give us victory over the flesh. Several years ago, when I was pastoring in St. Louis, we had a bus ministry, and the phone rang, and I answered, and this lady, she was pretty awkward. She said, I, I have some questions. I said, yes, ma'am, what can I help you with? She says, um, I'd like to send my kids to your Sunday school. How much does it cost? And I said, it doesn't cost anything. She said, it's free? I said, yes. She said, well, uh, there's a bus that comes by. Will you pick them up? How much does that cost? I said, it's free. And she said, free? Oh, good. And so she gave me the information. I said, ma'am, can I ask you why you're asking about this? I'm glad you are, and we'll be glad to pick up the kids. We'll be glad for you and your husband to come. And then she told me, she said, well, she said, my neighbor's kids were the meanest kids in the neighborhood. They terrorized everyone. When my kids were out playing and when those kids came out, they'd run in the house as fast as they could because they knew that there was going to be trouble. And she said, they started going to your Sunday school. And these kids are different now. They play with kids. They get along. They're not terrorizing the community. And then she said this. I'll never forget. She said, whatever you did to those kids, do to mine. Do you realize how important it is to get our kids in church and into the Word of God? It changes lives. Well, Betsy and I just got back a, a week or so ago. On, we went on a cruise, and what a, what a wonderful thing. You're talking about having it your way. Every morning when we woke up, there was a guy outside our door. He called us by name. He asked if we needed anything. He asked if he can go refresh in our room. He, he made up our bed. I didn't have to make up my bed. He, he got our you know, our towels and stuff, and he restocked everything. And then every time we'd leave, he'd always call us by name and stuff. So it was just really neat. When we went down to eat, the waiters knew what we liked to drink. I like Diet Coke. Betsy likes to have coffee with her dessert. And they would tell you, what would you like on the menu? And they said, if there's something not on the menu, we'll give it to you. And if you'd like something, we'll give you two or three. Wow. You know, remember my cake, candy, and cookies? That's... <laughs> And so they even give you double desserts if you want. And then they have all of these shows and all this thing, and people just treat you so nicely. And, and the ship, it, was, it has stabilizers, and I tend to get seasick even though I was in the Navy. And I didn't get sick. I didn't even have to wear patches. It was just so nice. But then I thought about when I was in the Navy, I was on a destroyer. And you know what? Things were not that way. You didn't get it your way. You got it the Navy way. But they did not have stabilizers on our ships. And you would go every which way. And I really do believe what's happened in our culture today is we've become so ingrained in our own needs and what we want that we want life to be a cruise ship. We want to have it our way. We want to have a big say. But brothers and sisters, those listening online and those that are here, I want to remind us, when we become Christians, we become a part of this spiritual battle. And we're not riding on a cruise ship. We're riding on a battleship. One that is ready to do battle. And you might be here and you might say, you know, I didn't come to church today hear about a battle. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. How many of you would all agree that there's going to be spiritual battles out there? But what are we going to do about it? How are we going to deal with it? The only way we can deal with it is to let the Lord deal with it. Would you stand with me, please?